you are now listening to episode 26 of the Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. In this episode, Dr. Taylor covers how to create healthy habits in 21 days. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com. All right, welcome to the Real Health Podcast. As always, I am your host, Dr. Taylor Crick, coming to you live from Salt Lake City, Utah right now. And, you know, I want to apologize because it's been a little bit over a month since we put out our last podcast episode. So if you're listening to this episode, it is now 2016. And so through December, you know, December is kind of a a weird month in the healthcare industry. Nobody really wants to care about their health until January. Even though, you know, we had a lot of patients lose weight through the holidays, get healthier through the holidays, but, you know, generalization. So we kind of took the month off from podcasting, but now it is 2016. It is a new year. So it's so excited to be back broadcasting the Real Health Podcast out to you guys. Uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about today, because it is a new year, we're going to talk about, you know, what are some of our goals or some of our healthy habits that we want to set for the year. I'll tell you first off, one of our healthy habits and one of our uh, objectives for the year is to release regular podcasts every week at a minimum. Regular podcasts, regular blog posts, and regular newsletters. So keep your eye out for those. Make sure that you subscribe on iTunes so that you know when the new, the latest episode gets released. But what I want to talk about today is, you know, creating healthy habits. We just had a workshop at our office yesterday, and what we're doing is we're kicking off a 21-day challenge for creating healthy habits. If you guys have ever heard, you know, the statistics on New Year's resolutions, well, they're they're dismal, and you probably can just think, you probably could have guessed, you know, and estimated about how bad they are. You know, at our workshop, we actually asked, and somebody said, uh, 10%, and somebody else said, uh, maybe 5% of people that succeed at their resolutions. And yeah, that's about right. It's actually 8% is what statistically they show people that actually succeed at New Year's resolutions. So one of the things that we are encouraging our patients and our community of listeners to do this year is instead of set a resolution, do something different. You know, we just kind of tend to associate the word resolution with failure. And what we're encouraging people to do this year is to create healthy habits. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about today is creating healthy habits and actually give you some examples that you can go and actually start to do every day or every other day, depending on the activity, you know, maybe it's exercise or something that you're not necessarily going to try to do every single day. But you can create healthy habits. And what we're doing is in the office, we're doing a 21-day challenge. Now, that is something that you had to be at the workshop to be a part of, or you could start now if you listen to this podcast episode. But this is something that you can do anytime throughout your, your life, really, throughout the year, though. If you're listening to this episode, what I would challenge you to do is no matter what the day is today, tomorrow, start a 21-day challenge healthy habit challenge. Now, if you look it up, you know, you can find a lot of information that says that it takes 21 days to create a healthy habit. Okay. And that's kind of old, outdated information. If you Google that 21 days to create a healthy habit, what you're going to find is a lot of people saying, oh, that's a myth. And, you know, maybe it takes 28 days or maybe it takes 15 days. But the, the real answer is that it's going to take different for every single person. We're all completely different. There's no magic number, but 21 days is not going to hurt. So if it's an activity that you're doing daily, 21 days is a great number. If it's an activity that say you're doing three times a week, like maybe uh, resistance training uh, uh, exercise, maybe you're doing that Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So maybe you want to do four weeks of that, or maybe for you in particular, five weeks is what it takes. You know, that's that's five weeks, that'd be uh, 15 different, 15 sessions of resistance training. Maybe that's what it's going to take for you. But what we're going to challenge you to do is to do a 21 day challenge. That's what we've chosen and what we're doing as an office right now. And what we're doing is we're picking five healthy habits that we want to stick to 
for 21 days. That can be as simple as, you know, brush your teeth every single day, or it can be as complex or, or hard or not hard, but, you know, as, uh, yeah, hard, intense as going grain free or sugar free or doing a ketogenic diet, which is high, high fat diet. So there's a lot of different things that you can do. But what I would encourage you to do is, you know, a variation of, of, of different levels. You know, don't do five really hard ones and don't do five really easy ones and don't do five nutritional ones and don't do five mindset ones. Pick five completely different ones of varying levels and really challenge yourself over these 21 days to really stick to these. Now, one thing that we want to mention is one of the reasons why so many resolutions fail is so many of them, first off, you know, they're just not uh, built on on a solid foundation. So when you look at goal setting and you look at what are the instructions for goal setting, and you know we're not going to talk about this in too much detail. You can look this up. This is uh, pretty easy to find information. But when you look at setting goals, you want to look at five areas. And so the the acronym is SMART. You want to set SMART goals. The S is specific. You want your goal to be specific, not like I want to feel better. I want to lose weight. Well, how much weight? If you lose a pound, are you going to be happy? Uh, so is it 10 pounds? Is it 15 pounds? Set a specific goal. That's the S. M is you want it to be measurable. So that's, once again, you know, you can measure 10 pounds. You can, you can measure weight loss too, but if it's specific and it's measurable, you know, feeling good is not something that can be measured. Weight is. Okay. So that, that's the M is measurable. A is you want it to be attainable. The goal has to be attainable. R is it has to be reasonable within reach, within reason. You know, if you want to lose 50 pounds in the next 20 days, sorry. Uh, you know, it's just not going to work. And so you're shooting yourself in the foot right from the beginning. And then T is you want it to be time-based. So if you want to lose 10 pounds, well, maybe you're going to lose 10 pounds by the time that you are 80, you know, uh, when you b become geriatric, you'll probably be 10 pounds lighter than you are now. But you have to set a time with this. So do you want to lose 10 pounds in the next month? Do you want to lose 50 pounds in 2016? So that's one of the reasons why people fail is they are not starting off with smart goals. The next reason why is because a lot of our goals, we start off based on willpower. They're driven by willpower. They're fueled by willpower. And, you know, willpower is an incredibly powerful thing. You know, we talked at the workshop about a, a study that was done over 40 years ago. Really, really famous study. One of the most famous studies ever done uh, as a Stanford study where they took four-year-olds, took hundreds of four-year-olds, put them in a room with a marshmallow and said, if you can wait 10 minutes and not eat this marshmallow, I'll give you a second marshmallow. Okay. And so the results were that the willpower of these four-year-olds was not very good. But here's the thing is that that was the original study that the willpower of these four-year-olds, you know, could, could have been quite a bit better. Uh, but then what they did is they, they looked at these kids later in life, throughout grade school, throughout high school. And what they noticed was the kids that expressed better willpower as four-year-olds actually were showing more signs of success as they got older. They scored an average of 210 points higher on their SAT scores, and they were just showing better signs of success. So willpower is an incredible you know, sign of, of success as far as goals, as far as making your resolutions attainable. Do you have the willpower? That's an important thing. But the biggest thing with willpower that we want to remember is that willpower is an exhaustible resource. Okay. So just like gasoline is an exhaustible resource in your car, you keep driving, you're going to run out of it. Okay. So willpower, you're going to run out of it if you're running only on willpower. That's why you see so many people at the gym right now, beginning of January, and then at the beginning of February, it's going to be about 50% as many, and then March, then it'll be about the same throughout the rest of the year until next January, because people are motivated by willpower. This year is going to be different. I'm going to lose that weight. But as soon as they fall off their resolution, they're done. So resolutions are set up for failure. What we're encouraging people to do this year is create healthy habits. Because when you create a healthy habit, it becomes automatic. And when you look at, you know, the research that's been done 
on healthy habits and on the power of habit, that's what you find is that there is a, you know, the actual activity, the actual habit is what they call automatic. Your brain kind of shuts down when you're doing the activity. And, you know, a lot of this research is coming from The Power of Habit, which is an awesome book by Charles Duhigg. And I would definitely recommend that you pick that book up or at least, you know, watch a summary or watch some of his TED Talks or things like that. But before we get into these 15 healthy habits, I want to talk about this science of a habit. So there are there's what's called the habit cycle. Okay, and the, and this is what they've discovered is that and they've known this for a while, but there's there's always with every habit, there's always a cue which is something that reminds you to do the habit, a cue, something that trigger, a trigger. Then there's the routine. So the routine itself, maybe brushing your teeth, maybe going to the gym, maybe um you know, taking the dog out. And then there is a reward. Okay, so there's a reward. The reward can either be avoiding pain or moving towards pleasure, but there's always a reward associated with all of your habits. For many, many years, what research has focused on is they've focused on the routine itself, the 15 different things that I'm about to give you, 15 different healthy habits. They focused on doing that activity itself. But what they found is when they've actually measured brain waves during a habitual activity, they've actually found that when the brain waves spike is during the cue and during the reward. But during the routine itself, the brain almost shuts down because that activity has become so automatic. It's become so much like clockwork that that's not a spike of brain activity. So what you need to focus on to change your habits, whether they be good habits or they be bad habits, what you really need to focus on is the cue, the trigger, and the reward. Okay, and so that reward oftentimes, that doesn't mean, you know, he gives an example of go for a run and give yourself a piece of chocolate. And that was probably very, very effective. You know, and that could probably change some habits. But does it have some some negative effects? Yeah, it does. You don't want to go run to give yourself chocolate, in my opinion. Uh, but what you want to do is you want to think about what is the reward. And this goes back to, you know, what we always talk about, remembering your big why and remembering your purpose. You know, if you are going to the gym, maybe the reward, you know, for a lot of people, the reward might be fitting in their swimsuit. But we always talk about, you know, that's such a short-term goal that it's never going to last. Maybe the reward should be and what you should be focused on, what you should be thinking of is that the reward is avoiding heart disease, okay, the number one killer worldwide. That's a huge, huge, huge reward. Many people listening have probably lost a loved one or a family member to heart disease. Maybe that's the reward is that you don't have to do that to your family. They don't have to feel what you felt when somebody else died of heart disease because they didn't know and they didn't take care of themselves 20 years sooner. But now you know, and you have that choice. So you have to connect yourself to the feeling. And it has to be long term, your big why your purpose, but you have to have a re reward with any healthy habit. What's the reward for going to sleep early? Well, it's the way that you might feel when you're well rested, the energy that you might have when you just have a really, really great day, you need to remember that feeling. And that's the reward. Now you also have to focus on the cue. What we did at our workshop here at the office is we had everybody write down their five healthy habits. And we had what we called a creation station. And they made these healthy habits on colorful construction paper and they put glitter and they put markers and sharpies and different things to dial these things up and decorate these things and they put magnets on them and they put stickers on them and they made different multiple copies one for the fridge one for the mirror one for their car because the cue is so important if you don't have a trigger you're never going to do the activity now sometimes the trigger can just be you know something that's so automatic like brushing your teeth the trigger for that for a lot of people is just what time is it? You know, am I getting up in the morning? Yes, that's the trigger. What's the reward? Not having your breath stink, not having your teeth rot, not having them fall out, right? So what's the cue for brushing them at night, maybe? Well, it's 8 o'clock at night. That's what time I brush my teeth. So you have to think about the cue. 
Don't forget about the cue. Do whatever you can to remind yourself about that for these 21 days. Literally put it on the background of your phone. Put it on your mirror so it's the first thing you see when you wake up. Put it in your shower. Put it on your fridge. Put it everywhere that you go. Put it in your car, right on your steering wheel so that you see these habits. You have to have the cue. Then you're going to do the routine and then focus on with each of the five habits. What is the reward that you're going to get long-term, not just instant gratification. So let's go through these 15 healthy habits. Now, what I said at the workshop on Saturday is that, you know, I'm going through 15 different healthy habits, but the reality is if you're writing down every single one, I'm probably going to say 50 because for each one, there's multiple examples. Okay. So like get outside, there's a million different things that you could do exercise, million different things that you could do. So you have to find out what speaks to you. But these are just some examples to stimulate some thought so that you can decide what you need to do for your life. Okay, so number one, the number one healthy habit that I suggested that people do for the next 21 days is pray and meditate. Okay, so prayer is, you know, just an integral part of my life. And that's one of the reasons why I put it as number one. Uh, I figured, you know, it doesn't make any sense for prayer to be in the middle or at the end. And even though these are in completely random order, uh, but prayer and meditation, you know, not only is there a religious component to those, which, you know, I don't put God, you know, first in my life. He's at the center of everything that we do and that we teach. So prayer is an important thing to me, but also it helps to regulate the stress response, prayer, meditation as well. Now, meditation is easier to talk about to teach because there's just a lot of different ways to pray. So based on your faith, based on your religion, you know, look up some ways to pray and, and, you know, you can figure that out yourself. But meditation, there's a lot of different ways to do that too, but it's a little bit easier to talk about. You know, you can go, we use, uh, personally, I use an app on my uh, phone or iPad for different guided meditations. You can have different ones for different reasons, whether it's stress or anxiety or sleep or work or, you know, just peacefulness, mindfulness, all these different things. You can find these apps that will guide you through a meditation. They're incredibly powerful. We've actually started doing them as a staff weekly. We do a guided meditation. One of our staff leads it every single Friday at our leadership meeting. So meditation, that actually blunts the stress response. And there's a lot of experts out there. You know, you can go back and listen to our stress workshop or stress, uh, different stress uh, podcasts on adrenal fatigue, things like that, rocks in your backpack, allostatic low, different things on stress. But a lot of experts believe that the stress response is the number one determining factor of how long you're going to live, of your life expectancy, your stress, your sympathetic response versus your parasympathetic response. If you live your life in sympathetic dominance, stressful state, you're going to live a shorter life. So that's number one, prayer and meditation. Number two is go to bed and get up earlier. Okay, so you can get so much done by getting up earlier in your day. Now, some of the times what the other side of that coin is, a lot of us just need to go to bed earlier. So once again, you can go back to past episodes. We've got some ones, uh, you know, that talk about how to get better night's sleep, things like that, what you can do, you know, to produce more melatonin earlier in the night. But the bottom line is really to shut off stimulation, probably an hour before you want to go to bed. You know, if you want to go to bed at nine, By 8 o'clock, you should be shutting down any of your electronics, your phone, your TV, big, big, big one. You know, a lot of us, 8 o'clock is, you know, when the good shows start. But you got to get rid of those TV shows and start going to bed early. Now, that also goes along with getting up early. You can get so much done. I recommend, you know, doing like a morning routine, you know, something in the morning. Uh, And, you know, even with the prayer and meditation, you know, that's a great time to get that stuff done. It's also a great exercise time going to bed earlier and getting up earlier. Now, one of the things with this is, you know, we see a lot of people with uh, sleep issues and we're working with them on their sleep issues. And a lot of times, you know, it's a, it's a hormone issue. But at the same time, what we're telling them as far as their habits are that, you know, you can only change really one of those two habits. It's not easy to tell your body when to go to sleep. You can't just say, hey, tonight I'm going to go to sleep at 730 when you're used to going to bed at midnight. 
But what you can change is you can always change what time you get up in the morning. If you're used to going to bed at midnight and waking up at 8 in the morning, if you start forcing yourself to wake up at 5 a.m., guess what? You're going to start getting tired earlier. So there's all those people that say, well, I just can't fall asleep. Well, that's because you have the TV on and you're texting and you're on your Instagram and you got the lights turned up and you just ate and you had caffeine at two o'clock in the afternoon. You had a Mountain Dew and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There, it's not, there is a cause. So just start getting up earlier. That's going to change that pretty quickly. Uh, number three is stretch and do yoga, stretch and or do yoga. This is hugely, hugely important. Uh, one of the reasons why I feel that stretching is so important is because of my work, you know, as a chiropractor and seeing so many people with back pain, with sciatica, with shoulder pain, with different issues and different pains, that it's because they let their bodies just get so stiff. So range of motion is one of those things that if literally it's cliche, but if you don't use it, you lose it. And you've got a lot of different joints in your body. You got to use a full range of motion. You got to stretch. You got to do yoga, even if it's, you know, five minutes a day. And so right now, the first three things, they're pray and meditate, go to bed or get up earlier and stretch or do yoga. And, you know, you can do all three of those healthy habits within five minutes a day. So some of this might just be a time management thing to implement some of these healthy habits. But how about you get up? 10 minutes earlier, you spend five minutes praying, you spend five minutes stretching and kind of meditating at the same time or doing yoga and meditating, then you've killed four of them with 10 minutes and that's just the beginning of your day. So number four healthy habit is to eat a healthy fat with every meal. This is something that if you are, you know, this is one of the basics of, of nutrition that if you're not doing this yet, start doing it. Eat a healthy fat with every meal. Maybe that's an avocado. Maybe that's some nuts or seeds. Maybe that's a coconut product. Maybe it's, you know, salmon at, at dinner. Maybe it's olives, uh, you know, on a salad. Um, yeah, there's a lot of chia seeds, flax seeds, you know, a lot of different healthy fats that you can add to every meal. But you got to be getting enough healthy fats. Me, myself, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about, number nine, is eat a ketogenic diet. I'm eating 60 to 85%, probably about 85% fat. Today, I'll probably be 85 to 90% fat in my diet. That's crucial for healthy hormones. It's crucial for decreasing inflammation. It's crucial for true cellular detox. You have to eat a lot of healthy fats. If you aren't yet, start just by adding one in with every single meal. That's an easy thing. By 21 days, not only are you going to have a habit, but you're going to be considerably healthier. Number five is what's called intermittent fasting. This is something that is all the rage right now in the healthcare world and also in our office, in our practice, because we're all doing it. We've got a lot of patients that are losing lots of weight. And really this started by, you know, it's something that I've read about for a while and, and have done plenty of times in the past, but I'm starting to read a lot about it for weight gain but it started with, you know, one of our patients who had lost a lot of weight, you know, gotten off like 10 medications, but her weight loss had plateaued. It really plateaued for, for like eight months, you know, really plateaued for a long time. And she started doing intermittent fasting and she lost 20 pounds in the next two months. Okay, so intermittent fasting, what that means, there's several ways that you can do it. We have a couple different podcast episodes on it, the benefits of intermittent fasting. You can skip a whole day, uh, you know, and fast for an entire day and just not eat for an entire day. But the most healthy way to do it, the way that I am doing it currently, the way that I have been for, you know, a, a while and have done it in the past as well. Now I'm strict on it. I used to do, you know, a couple days a week intermittent fast. And it really just means, you know, skip breakfast a lot of days. But now I'm, I'm 100% strict on it. But eat within an eight-hour window and fast for a 16-hour window. That's every single day. Fast for a 16-hour window. Now, women, you can go as low as 14 hours. Not recommended, you know, if you're breastfeeding or if you have any, uh, uh, consult your healthcare physician or, you know, send me an email even if you're considering this. But eating for a 16 hour or fasting rather for a 16 hour period. Now that means for me today at noon, I started eating or I started cooking. I ate six eggs, 
with two avocados. And in there, I had a lot of, you know, I'm doing ketogenic, so a lot of fats. So I had about a half a stick of butter. And I had a generous amount of almond cheese on top of that. It was, it was, you know, really good. Then, you know, I went to the gym. Then I am now drinking a shake, which is a can of coconut milk. So a can of coconut milk has a ton of saturated fat, a ton of good, healthy, quality fats. It's like 600, 700 calories just of fat alone. So I'm saying, you know, 80 to 90% fat base in my diet tonight for dinner. I'm going to have some form of salmon, you know, with a lot of plants uh, with it uh, and, and just eating a lot of animal products, high quality though, grass fed, grass finished, you know, that's really, really important. But the intermittent fasting, I'm going to be done by eight o'clock. At eight o'clock, I'm done eating and I don't eat another calorie afterward uh, because I'm intermittent fasting. So I'm eating during this eight hour window as much as I can ketogenic fat based but after that, I'm done so. So that's intermittent fasting. Once again, go back, listen to the podcast episodes. It's actually been shown to elevate HGH, human growth hormone, 2,000% in men and 1,200% in women. So that's your fat burning, muscle building hormones. So if you've ever seen me, I don't have any fat to burn. I'm actually doing it to help build muscle, but it works both ways. So try intermittent fasting. Uh, number six is exercise, you know, just a crucial, crucial thing. You know, we always talk, excuse me, talk about that exercise is the most research proven thing for, you know, for health ever, uh, for heart disease, for cancer, for diabetes, for inflammation, for obesity, for mood, for depression, for everything. Exercise is awesome. So, you know, there's a million ways to do this too. And I, I love exercising. You know, I just came from the gym where I was lifting weights, uh, heavy weights today, which also stimulates HGH, testosterone. But, you know, yesterday I was skiing. So for, I don't know, four or five hours I was skiing and I was in the back country. So I was skiing, getting a good leg workout while also hiking and climbing, you know, probably climbed three or 4,000 vertical feet, you know, just kind of tooling around yesterday. Uh, and burned a lot of calories. But exercise is something that if you're not doing it, you have to be. I mean, you literally have to be. You can't fix everything with diet. You got to be exercising. So the bottom line is do it. Uh, the number one type of exercise that we like is the surge type exercise. That is the most efficient. It's the quickest as the best hormone response as far as your insulin sensitivity, as far as your HGH and testosterone to help you burn fat and build muscle for up to 36 hours afterward. So go back and listen to the episode, uh, you know, top three tips for weight loss. That talks quite a bit about surge type exercising, but that's number six is exercise. Number seven is get outside. Now, this is no matter where you live, uh, you need to get outside. There's a there's literally health benefits of being outside. Not only that the air is cleaner, you know, we're in Utah where we have you know nasty air if you're not from here. But there's times where we have really nasty air down here in the city. But the EPA has even said that the indoor air is 2 to 70 times more toxic than outdoor air. So getting good, clean air is huge. Getting sunlight is so incredibly important. There is no substitute for it with these fluorescent lights that we're used to being under. Actually getting sunlight causes a lot of just hormonal changes as far as your, your sleep cycles. Uh, getting actual sunlight, not to mention what it does for your vitamin D. Now, like here in Utah in January, not a lot of people are getting a lot of sun exposure on their skin. So they need to be supplementing with vitamin D. But there's a lot that the sun does for you. There's a lot that, you know, just being in contact with the earth does for you too. Grounding, negative ions, a lot of good to reconnect with the earth, not just from a spiritual perspective, but from a physiological and health perspective perspective, but get outside. Number eight is to say affirmations. Now, that's an excellent healthy habit that's, you know, triggered in something called neuro-linguistic programming, okay? That's changing your psychology, changing your mindset. Saying affirmations is one of the most powerful ways that you can do this. Now, what I do is I have my affirmations laminated and I say them in the shower, that's just what works for me. What's recommended a lot of times is to say them in the mirror so you're looking at yourself in the face, give yourself good eye contact, stand with good strong posture. But this is another thing that you know you can look up and 
you know, you, you have to find affirmations that speak to you. Look up how to write good affirmations. Look up, you know, a hundred examples of affirmations and go through and circle the ones that you like. And you might come up with a list of five or 10 that are going to be great for you to say every single day. These are amazing for getting over limiting beliefs, which a lot of times are what hold us back in life are our limiting beliefs. So neuro-linguistic programming through saying affirmations, hugely, hugely powerful. One of the most powerful things you could ever do for yourself. Number nine is eat a ketogenic diet. So we've already touched on that a little bit. That's a high, high fat diet. When you eat fat, you teach your body how to burn fat. And fat is a very efficient fuel source. So this is something that even like a, you know professional cyclists and marathon runners are starting to do is to eat a ketogenic diet because they can last on a five-hour ride or five-hour run or whatever. They can last because they have efficient fuel burning because their body runs on fat. Now it takes, it's not something that you just do it in a day, you're, you're ketogenic because you ate 75, 85% fats. It takes about three weeks to turn your body actually into a state of ketosis. This is actually a state of altered physiology where your body's using different, different fuel sources, using ketones for a fuel source. Now that's actually really, really good for brain health, your brain is actually more efficient when it runs on ketones. So this is great for Alzheimer's prevention, prevention of neurodegeneration. You know, I'm doing it right now, but one of the things that, that I said right away was, man, I need my mom to start doing this, my parents to start doing this. We have some dementia in our family, and it's something that they're always aware of, and they always want to do anything they can to combat this. So doing a couple months straight of ketogenic or, you know, being on it for the most part, you know, for, for the rest of your life can be a good thing. Now, I'm a big fan of diet alteration and variation, not doing the same thing for the rest of your life, really, but slight variations here and there. But going through a ketogenic state can be really, really beneficial. Along those same lines, if you are going to go ketogenic, you inherently have to be low sugar. So number 10 is to go grain free and sugar free. This is something that I think that everybody should do. This is one of the basics of the paleo diet is go grain free and sugar free. And this is not even close to controversial anymore that, you know, sugar is really destroying us and causing all the health concerns that we have today. You know, there's a, a link to obviously the big ones, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, but even, you know, the, the next biggest one, autoimmune conditions, you know, inflammation, which is at the root of all of our major diseases. Sugar is the devil. Uh, but grains are so inflammatory. And, you know, so many people are going sugar-free. So they're eating, you know, like their crystal light, uh, you know, juice with artificial sweeteners and they're drinking their diet Coke and then they're eating their gluten-free pizza and that's sugar, 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 sugar coming from the gluten-free grains. It's still grains. And the other ones, the artificial sweeteners are even worse. They're neurotoxic. You don't want those anywhere near your brain. But go grain-free, sugar-free is such an important move for so many of us to literally just cut them out. Now, some people are celiac. Some people are gluten sensitive. So they go gluten free. But my least favorite thing in the world to see is somebody that's gluten free that still eats a bunch of grains, that drinks gluten free beer and eats gluten free pizza and eats rice and corn and these grains that don't contain gluten but they're still so inflammatory. So getting rid of all grains is what I recommend. An occasional dose of some of the pseudo grains like quinoa that's from the grass family, you know, even some of the ancient grains like amaranth, uh, millet, you know, some of those that I, I don't touch them, but I'm okay with those occasionally. And I mean, really, really occasionally. But for the next 21 days, what I would challenge you to do is to try one of these two things, either go ketogenic, go high, high fat. And you can look that up. You know, there's a keto app, there's a keto website, there's keto cookbooks, there's keto everything, or go grain free, sugar free. And that's really easy to find the information for, find the recipes, find the books. Uh, that's really uh, popular information today. So go grain free, sugar free, go high fat. Five more. So uh, number 11, 
take the right supplements, take the right healing supplements. So, so many people are taking the wrong supplements. Go back and listen to past podcasts, but so many people, you know, are making an effort taking like a multivitamin or something. But when you look at really our diet today and what's causing a lot of our health concerns, we're not deficient in very many things. You know, vitamin D, absolutely. Omega-3s, absolutely. Iodine, magnesium, I'd say that's about it. As far as our deficiencies, a lot of our other things come from, you know, toxicities in the cell, but take the right healing supplements, toxicity or inflammation. And you could take supplements for that. One of the supplements that I'm the most excited about is called Cyto Detox. This is one that we're starting to carry this week. It's inbound to the office. Um, and really, you know, you got to look it up. Go to www.cyto, which is C-Y-T-O. That means cell detox.com. This is true cellular detox. And I literally mean that, that it's not a colon cleanse, not a liver cleanse, not a gallbladder cleanse. It is true cellular detox. It is a binder of things, a true binder of things. It can it can help get rid of detoxify heavy metals, other xeno xenoestrogens or xenobiotics, which are unknown toxic particles. They get stuck in the cell. So take the right healing supplements. Number twelve is keep a gratitude journal. An incredibly uh, cool healthy habit to do. You know, just every day write down what you're grateful for. You can do it a million ways. Write down one thing. Write down three things. Write down five things. I have something called a five-minute journal, which every day it's a fill-in-the-blank. It has a morning and an evening. You spend five minutes answering these questions. What's what was you know what were three things that you were grateful for today? Things like that. I one time did a gratitude journal for my wife. I did it for a month. I got the idea from Darren Hardy, who uh, did it for a year. So <laughs> I thought a month would sounded a little bit better for me. But every day for a month. I kept a secret journal and just wrote down what I was grateful for her for. And, you know, when I gave it to her, you know, it might as well have been a year. It meant the world to her. And it was just awesome for me, too, to remember how awesome she is and, and what all I'm grateful for and all the millions of things that, you know, despite our busy life and things like that, all the things that I have such gratitude towards her for. Number 13, this is a huge one. Give something up. Okay, so all these so far are habits that you can start. And, you know, except for, you know, grain-free, sugar-free, um, that none of the others are, are give anything up. Give something up. A lot of us just have some destructive habits that along with our constructive habits that we need to start doing or maybe we do a good job of, we also have destructive habits. So give something up. I don't know what it is. Only you know what it is. But find your destructive habit. And for 21 days, give it up cold turkey, no questions asked. Two more. Number 14 is read a book or read daily. Uh, and what, you know, what I encourage people to do is, you know, not, not a novel, uh, something, and, and you can read novels. A lot of people read novels and it's just personality type. So, uh, you know, if you're reading novels, they're great. Reading is so incredibly important. I believe in reading paper books, not reading Kindles or anything that, that can hurt your eyes or that's still just really stimulatory. Uh, but, Read something that's going to move your life in a more positive direction. You know, that's what we're all about here on the Real Health Podcast. So that's what we're going to encourage you to do is for 21 days, read a book. That's one of my big ones. I told the crowd, uh, you know, this weekend at our workshop, so that is one of my huge ones that I read a lot of tidbits. I, you know, I read a lot of newsletters. I read a lot of magazines. I read a lot of journals. I read a lot of research things like that, but I haven't been reading as many books as I would like to. So today, for example, you know, I read already today a book that I'm reading right now called Primal Body, Primal Mind. So really awesome book, but, uh, you know, already read today. So that's one of my goals. And then the last one, the most important one, I'd say the most overlooked one, take care of your spine. Uh, that is a healthy, healthy habit. And when it becomes a healthy habit, you prevent problems down the road. Back pain, the number one cause of disability worldwide. Now, I don't think you should even take care of your spine to avoid back pain. You should, but that's that's number 10 on the priority list. You know, there's so many that are more important as far as just overall health and function of your nervous system. But even just to avoid back pain, take care of your spine. When it comes to healthy habits, you know, it, it drives me crazy. My dad's a dentist. It drives me crazy that the American Dental Association has gotten everybody in America, everybody in the world for that matter, to brush their teeth. 
daily, right? That is such a normal thing that you never even think that if you don't do that, you'd be so abnormal if you don't brush your teeth daily. Well, they've gotten everybody to do that just because they've made it a habit and it's become an expectation. But we do nothing for the health of our spine. And the thing with teeth is that, you know, they help you chew your food, they help you look good, but they're replaceable. The spine is not replaceable and it surrounds and protects your body's brainstem, spinal cord, and nervous system and has an intricate relationship with intricate and intimate relationship with the nervous system. So the healthier spine directly reflects the healthier nervous system and vice versa in your body's ability to heal and function overall. We could take, you know, a hundred people and blindfold, you know, a few chiropractors and have them palpate their spines. And based on the stiffness, based on the, you know, just degeneration, based on the problems of their spine without knowing anything about their health history, we could put them in order zero to a hundred, who is the most healthy and the least healthy, I'm willing to guarantee it. So take care of your spine. That goes back to number two or number three, actually stretch or do yoga. But we give all of our patients home rehab equipment. They do traction for their spine. They do specific exercises. But the most important thing, you know, you don't need to do this every day for 21 days, but the most important thing you can do for the rest of your life is get adjusted. If you got adjusted even once a month for the rest of your life, it can make such a world of difference. And even the research proves this. You know, the research proves 85% fewer uh, pharmaceutical costs, 60% fewer hospital admissions, you know, all those things that have been proven with lifetime chiropractic care. But by taking care of your spine, by reducing subluxation as a stressor and as a interferer with normal function, you're going to greatly, greatly increase your chance of longevity and a long, healthy life. But those are 15 healthy habits. There's, you know, a hundred different ways to do those 15 healthy habits. The challenge is for you to pick five, do them for 21 straight days. Maybe you're going to read a book and set a time with that. Remember the SMART goals, you know, read a book for five minutes every day. Shut your TV off by 8.30 every night. Eat a good fat with every meal. Go grain-free, sugar-free, and ketogenic. Eat a paleo and extreme uh, paleo-keto diet, which is going to be awesome for your overall health. Get outside three days a week, maybe. Maybe you're going to walk for 30 minutes outside three days a week. Do these healthy habits. Your life is going to thank you in the future. And then this year, you won't say, oh, I failed on my resolution. You'll say, oh, I've created healthy habits that are going to last me a lifetime. So as always, this is the Real Health Podcast. I am Dr. Taylor Crick, your host. Make sure that you check us out online at you know Real Health, www.realhealthwithdrtaylor.com. Um, make sure that you download past episodes, go back and look at those, watch our YouTube channel. You can see what's going on in our office here in Salt Lake City, how we're really changing and transforming people's lives. And make sure that, you know, you could definitely pop me an email too, Dr. Taylor, D-R-T-A-Y-L-O-R at we align, A-L-I-G-N, Utah.com. Dr. Taylor at WeAlignUtah.com. Make sure that you send in any questions or any ideas for upcoming episodes that you'd like to hear about in 2016. So start off your healthy habits. Can't wait to hear from some of you how it's going. And stay tuned next time. We're going to talk about the paleo diet. Thank you for listening to the Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com.